Hey, practice owners, we're back with a, another edition of Coming Back Stronger, and I'm uh, very, very excited to have our guest on today, uh, Heidi Mount uh, of Heidi Mount Consulting. How are you doing today, Heidi? I am doing fabulous. How are oh, you? Fantastic. So <laughs> Heidi is um, quarantining in Hawaii, is that right? That is correct. I'm on the big island. On the big island. Awesome. And I, we were talking earlier, um, you know, I don't know whether I'm, I'm a little upset about it because I'm literally supposed to be in Hawaii right now for the first time, never been. So the coronavirus is, uh, you know, it's impacted my life. Uh, it's pretty tough. Um, like my, my daughter would tell me, you know, that's a first world problem that I don't, you know, I don't get to go to Hawaii <laughs> because there's a coronavirus, but you know. So we kind of, um, this, with this series, Heidi, we, you know, we kind of talked about it. We're, we're, we're speaking to practice owners who are, um, right now, you know, they went to dental school. They want to be a dentist. They want to see patients. They want to do all those things that they, you know, that they were trained to do and they love to do and they've done for many years. And, you know, these difficult things, they want to just hand off to the office manager and say, take care of that. I'm going to go back and see patients, but they can't right now. So what we're, what we've uh, discussed are ways that, you know, you and I uh, talked a little earlier, a couple things that you can help in what you've done, um, mm -hmm that are nuts and boltsy that they can do today and then things they can lay the groundwork for, for when we do get back, which we will. Uh, we don't know the day and we don't know the hour. And, and to some degree, we don't know what it's gonna look like, but we are gonna get back. So if we could just start off with, um, you know, quick minute, explain, you know, who Heidi is. We all know you live in Hawaii. So, you know, that's, that's pretty awesome. Um, but how you got to where you are, your kind of history in dentistry, and then we'll jump right into some, some advice and tips for docs. You got it. I know you're friends with Linda Miles like myself. I've been in dentistry since 1988, so I've been around the block a long time. I worked as a RDA and expanded function dental assistant and office manager in a couple states. I've been coaching dentists at study clubs, speaking all over and internationally, and um, helping a hundreds of dentists uh, grow their practice. So um, this came about as I was working full time. My dad pretty much worked until he retired and then he passed away right after. Now he wasn't a dentist, but I know how stressed out dentists are. I know how big the bills are. I paid the, the doctor's bills. I, I allocated pension plans, did all kinds of things um, and realized, boy, there's a lot of bills to run a practice. So every practice I was in, I was doubling their profit and what have you. And I just kind of had a niche for the business sense of the practice. Obviously, I trained team members and things like that. But throughout this time, um, I guess knowing my dad worked so hard and didn't really get to enjoy retirement made me motivated to help more dentists than the one I was working for, the ones in town and things like that. So I decided to step out and be a virtual coach. And I figured there's tons of dental consultants that do an office consulting and I wanted to be different. So I developed a business that we can actually coach, you know, just right over lunch. And, you know, it kind of ties into all of this is dentists are more stressed out than ever right now. And I, I really feel bad for them. I'm helping, I'm working seven days a week, helping so many. And so th this is what I wanted to share with you actually, when you had asked me to be on the podcast, um, what actionable items they can do is kind of, you know, all the things they should be doing while they're working, all the things that plug the, the leaks in the business um, that they never have time to do. So that's kind of what they should be doing during the shutdown. And like you said, they pass it off to the office manager, which is not really a good thing when half the dentists are being embezzled on, mm -hmm. right? Right. We've got to learn our software. That's tip number one. Have to learn your software. You've got to learn how to run your own reports. You've got to know what you're looking for. So a doc who is, um, again, is that mindset, which is very, very common. Um, you know, again, I, I went to school. I went to Indiana University Business School, and we, we learned all these things. You know, a P&L, and, a, you know, I've always been uh, amazed when, when I would say that. I would have somebody ask me, you know, hey, can you help me with a, my practice? And I would say, sure. The first thing is, you know, let me take a look at a P&L and a balance sheet. And they would say, all right, hang on. They would call their accountant and get last year's tax return. And I would say, no, 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 that's, you know, 
uh, without getting too deep into the accounting, that's number one, looking in the rear view mirror. And number two, I'm massaging it so I pay as little as taxes as possible. What I want to know is how well the business is running. And that that's a thing that, you know, with all due respect, they don't teach in dental school. And today, um, you know, in the middle of April, uh, the weeks are all running together and the days are running together. But in the middle of eight, April, in the shutdown, when suddenly they've got a lay, you know, uh, team off and patients aren't coming in and you have to file for EIDL loans and PPP loans and you really just want to call your accountant or your office manager and you can't, you're stuck doing it. And what I'm seeing, I mean, you can share with me if you, if you see this, I see a lot of, I see two types of practice owners and they're all dentists, you know. So when I say practice owner, I mean a dentist who owns a practice, not, a, not an MBA who owns a DSO. Um, but there are two kinds. There, there's one group that says, well, I'm closed. There's nothing I can do. So I'm going to sit at home and I'm going to catch up on, you know, last three seasons of Game of Thrones or whatever it is. <laughs> and I'm, you know, I'm going to play with the grandkids and all that is neat. But, you know, uh, um, I'd like to hear your opinion, Heidi. There are a lot of ducks, those ducks who aren't going to come back. Um, they are, there's a, this is an unprecedented situation where a gigantic chunk of your revenue is just going to go missing this year and not understanding cash flow is going to, I mean, it literally can put you out of business. So there's that group. And then there are the docs we're going to talk to and hopefully maybe swing a few over. Um, but they see this as an opportunity to do exactly what you said. Um, uh, and maybe dig down deep into that, something they've never thought of before. They've never run a report. Um, they told somebody to do it, they got it, they looked at it. Maybe they get one on their desk every you know, Friday afternoon and they pretend to look at it and move on. But that, that instead of being sort of inconvenient, now it's become critical. So where do you think, where should they start? If they're gonna say, all right, I'm gonna tackle this, I'm gonna learn stuff about my practice maybe I've never known, and I'm going to have to if I want to, number one, stay in business, and number two, maybe take a chance to improve. Where are some places they can literally get their hands on and start? Mm -hmm. The first thing they have to do is go, what's going well and what's not going well? Okay. So if scheduling, if you're finding patients are waiting, you can't be in three places at once. The schedule's chaos. People are mad because they're waiting in a room or doctors triple book. I mean, that... That's the most common problem that I have seen when we analyze businesses this year throughout this process of COVID. Um, and so what's happening is every time they said, we're gonna open in two weeks, people were rescheduling the same crappy schedule two weeks later. Right. Um, so I say, start with a clean slate and design your business the way you want it to run now. So decide the hours you wanna work, what type of patients you want to work on, how you want it to schedule. They should lay out the schedule and how it should look. Show your team a visual image that I want, uh, you know, a $3,000 appointment here and here. I want the new patients here and here, that type of thing. Like design your perfect day so you do not have to um, run around with your head cut off or, you know, analyze accounts, have them audit accounts, have checklists for your team members before they schedule, for example, are they a no-show patient? We can't afford to see people who have no-show and short notice cancel history. Right. Do they have a bad account? Well, why are we seeing them if their count's not even current, right? So those two people would be further down the waiting list of who I would call when you're gonna design your new day with a blank slate, um, calling patients and scheduling. So I recommend having a spreadsheet. It could be Excel spreadsheet, and I have those if people want them and it has some questions, they fill in the blanks, they prioritize the patients and schedule them so you can reach your goal. If your goal is making $8,000 a day, three months ago, maybe it needs to be $10,000 a day to make up for the six weeks you've been off. I don't know, you, there's some math to do, right? So there's one thing to analyze your numbers, your P&Ls and all that, but there's another thing is how are we gonna fix these numbers, right? Um, but running reports, um, I, I, you know, definitely run, your unscheduled treatment list okay. and go through those treatment plans and make sure everything is detailed in there. In other words, I don't wanna see night guard because I don't know <laughs> am I seeding it or am I taking an impression? So right. add 
codes that are no charge codes, add them to your system, a wax try and a teeth try and an implant torquing, whatever, whatever visits that you are doing, create those codes so everyone in the office knows what's next. You have visit one, visit two, visit three. But you gotta take the time to create the, the no charge codes. Um, you can also reorganize your codes to get the codes you don't use out of there. So when you go to your um, procedure codes of preventative, oral surgery, whatever, get some codes out of there. If you're not doing a non-precious metal crown, get it out, prevent the mistakes of somebody posting a $600 crown or some fee you haven't updated because mm. you don't do it, right? So it's all about preventing air. Um, obviously, right now, everyone should be working on their AR. Accounts receivable is numero uno. Just because it says insurance is billed doesn't mean the insurance is paid. You have nothing better to do. Let's click on the claim. Let's read the narrative. Is there a narrative? Let's get one in there. If there's not a period chart or an x-ray or photo or something that's needed, let's get it billed correctly so we don't find out in two months and have to rebill all over because you didn't evaluate it while you're off. We're yeah. delaying money coming in. Um, so accounts receivable is a big, big deal. A lot of doctors don't understand the zero to 30 bucket, the 30 to 60, the over 90 mm -hmm. and all that. We need to understand that because once they reach that 90 day bucket, you have probably a 12% chance of collecting that money. So we don't ever want it to hit that bucket. We don't want to loan money to our patients. And I know in the olden days, you know, if you have dentists, you know, over 50, 60, and I'm <laughs> in that older group, mm -hmm. um, we used to do a handshake, right? We, we right. Handshake. They're used to paying. They're used to this. They're used to that. We don't care anymore. We are coming back and we got to come back strong and we need to run it like a business, just like the medical office and the grocery stores and everybody else. We need to collect um, at the time of service or prior. And at this point, they could even say, you know what? We have hundreds of people to schedule and we're going to go ahead and streamline it. We're going to go entirely paperless. I'm going to email you your treatment plan. I'm going to tell you how much you owe and we're going to take care of all your money and then we're going to reserve your appointment. We can kind of have some, some patients have some skin in the game. We may even want to change our, our um, financial policy that they sign saying that, you know, we're going to collect this portion. And by the way, $200 is a reservation deposit. If you do not show, you're going to forfeit that. There's a lot of different ways to run your business, but come back strong because we have lost money and we can't afford to lose anymore. Right. You, yeah, you got that's a lot to unpack there. And that's uh, I mean, that is an amazing. So I was writing a couple things down. Um, coronavirus heightened awareness, you know, paperless. Um, I, and I've done a ton of interviews. And of course, you know, with what I do with the Profitable Dentist magazine, I get a lot in that is super high on sort of the awareness list. The clinical side, you know, dental aerosols and things we never thought about and operatory with you know, papers taped onto cabinets and, you know, um, uh, teddy, fuzzy, fuzzy teddy bears decorating and it's all nice, but you're going to have patients who come in and think, uh-oh, dental aerosol, um, whether it's clinically right or not, their perception is clean or dirty. And one of those is paper or, or even step back. One of those is pens. So if you've gone out from quarantine just to pick up something at a restaurant, I went in one the other day and they had two cups and one said, and it, there were pens in this one and it said uh, cleaned. And then this one was um, used. So, you know, if you were going to sign a ticket, then you pulled a pen out and you wrote on it and you put it over there. Little things like that we've never thought of are going to become super conscious to your patients. And yeah, the paperless part of it, th think of all the paper that goes through. So just picking that one, um, and then I've got AR is like off the chart. Um, mm -hmm. um, so what is something somebody could do paperless wise right now that would, I mean, I'm assuming most software, you could do it if you wanted to. It's just yeah, there's lots a of hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. So we want all the, all the forms, health histories, whatever you need to be available on the website to fill it out. So the, they should be an online fill out merge in with your system. That's best case mm -hmm. scenario. If not, then they fill it out online and it's emailed or what have you. 
um, but there should be no paper going back and forth. So you're, it's all about benefit statements with your patients. You could send out a letter saying, this is, this is how we have stepped it up with our sterilization process. We're going paperwork. It's eco-friendly. Mm -hmm. We give these type of benefits to them um, that you'll be getting all your receipts via email and what have you. So you have to have a HIPAA compliant email. Some doctors are not doing the whole email campaigns or text message and email, but that's a must. Mm -hmm. um, you've got to be able to send it HIPAA compliant um, through a professional system. But yeah. I and those are things you can be you can be doing going paperless now, which is a which is a hurdle um, that you know history or update it. Mm -hmm. But what you know, yeah, what better time? So two other quick things. One is the an AR AR in the calendar. AR is um, and tell me your thoughts on this. Uh, um, it's dentists practice owners. I don't think understand AR. It is a, so I, when I, back in my consulting days before I even did this and I own dental practices and own, own, you know, the business part of it. And I would walk into somebody and look at it and they would have, it, it, they do $840,000 a year and they've got $903,000 worth of AR. And I, I said, you're a bigger bank than you are a dental practice. You've loaned out more money interest free for work you've done than work you're doing now in a year. And like this, the whole concept of it was, you know, just, it, it's not there. So money, A, your accounts receivable is money that's not paid you for work you've done. Now in today's world, there's, there's two areas of that. And, you know, we're not going to call patients and beat them up for money today uh, for obvious reasons. Um, but there's the other side of that. There's the, um, and I always say it's the administrative side. Number one, Delta Dental's working today. They are processing claims right now while, while we're having this conversation. And number two, they're not paying you uh, because, you know, they're missing a paycheck because they're quarantined. They're not paying you for an administrative thing, a narrative they didn't like or a narrative that wasn't there. Or, uh, um, and you, you, I'm sure you know way more about this than I do. Bund it wasn't bundled right or it wasn't coded right. Or it wasn't, it's some little administrative thing that they're not going to call you and say, hey, doc, we know we owe you $37,312.11. And we really hope you, you know, get your paperwork in order so we can send you a check. After so much time, it, they just don't owe it to you anymore. Is that right? Yeah. So right. if somebody dives into it, would you, is that where you would suggest they start? Insurance companies and, you know, technical, the administrative pieces of it? Well, I would start with insurance first because they're willing to pay. They have money to pay, right? Mm -hmm. Employees might be laid off or something, or patients might, might. be laid off. Um, so the, the guaranteed money is getting that insurance done properly. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this is something to also analyze in your software is updating all the insurance information. For example, if you have duplicated plans in your, in, in your software and somebody says, I verified that benefit and they put it in the software, when you go to quote another patient, those benefits will not be in there if you have multiple um, plans. Uh -huh. So you have to shut down the system and merge the plans together. That way, once you've verified and got all the details that they cover, cleanings once, a, you know, once every six months or twice a year, or the fluoride's up to 14, or all these details we need, um, they're, they're going to have to call again if it's blank in another person's chart. So it's best to make sure you have just one insurance to that group member or employer. Um, and so merging, a lot of employees have added plans as they get insurance cards. They have a lot of turnover and whatever. I highly recommend outsourcing your insurance because it's just so much better. Yeah. But uh, merging your insurance companies is something a doctor would never think to do, but it's so very important to streamline your business because time is, we can't have people wasting time. We need them calling patients. We need them communicating with patients. And so if they're busy, stuck on hold or punching buttons on an insurance company, it's just a big waste of time. So that would be something else they should fix while they're closed. And they're not gonna do this. It's just an irritating thing for team members. And then, you know, it all pays the same in their hourly rate. So they don't care what they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. they're, you know, they're getting paid the same whether you, you yep whether they work really hard and collect it for you or don't. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, and the other thing is on, on that front, time is, I mean, you, 
you know, you have the time and they're, even if you put somebody on or you, you know, work around their unemployment or they just volunteer their time or however that part works out, um, somebody can really make a big impact on, on uh, getting the AR cleaned up. And, you know, and I don't know how that, you know, that, that factors into what you do, but, you know, can you pay a, somebody a percentage? You know, if you have, if you look at your AR to insurance companies and you've got $187,000 out there, that's, you know, average 45 days old, when I think there's a time limit, they have to pay 30 days after they approve it. Is that right? Or some, uh, period, some period of time? Are you talking insurance? Insurance, yeah. yeah. Some are 12 months and some are 24, but okay. most, majority are 12 months. And so if, if you don't collect it by then, it's, it's gone. And and so I wanted to use that as sort of a segue into the other, something else that you said about the calendar and about scheduling, because, um, you know, now you have time to do this. Now, now you have time to focus on some AR and get it cleaned up that you don't have when you're seeing patients four days a week and everybody's crammed and they're going to come in on a Friday morning and do a little bit of insurance and clean the office. But, you know, you know how that goes and AR keeps cranking up. So I want to get a handle on that, but the schedule so I, I'd like to get your opinion on as we come back. Um, I think there are docs out there that think they're just gonna, you know, they they're gonna get they're gonna get a text from you know the president that says, okay, you know, we're opened up, and they go back in and they say, all right, what am I, you know, what's my day look like? And they, I mean, they really believe that that it just goes back to normal. And so I've had two schools of thought. One is that there are a lot of practices that aren't opening. And I know, I mean, I know for a fact there are a lot of docs who are just there, they have to fold it up. So there are a lot of displaced patients. So they're looking for a new dentist. And again, you know, that's probably a marketing discussion, but you want to be the one that they say, hey, you know, that place looks great and they're doing all these things and I'll try them. And how that looks, but it's not one day, it's some slope over time. So how do you see that? Assuming that, you know, we trickle back in, how should they schedule? Because I, I think you're, you're spot on. There's going to be a point where everybody who missed hygiene is suddenly hitting us all at once because we pushed them back, pushed them back, pushed them back. Now we're open and we've, mm -hmm. we've got that jammed up. How do you see that playing out? How, and how would you tell, you know, suggest somebody handle that? Yeah, well, I can tell you what's been happening all over as I'm analyzing so many businesses. Um, and, and as a patient, since some patients aren't going to want to come in for their cleaning, they're going to wait until September or something like that. So some are scared and some are willing to come in, some are anxious and others are waiting. Um, they don't know when this is going to relapse or whatever. But what I'm seeing the employees doing is um, a couple things. They're just given the same crappy schedule that they had two right. months ago. Um, or they're saying we have, you know, 51 crown seats that we need to schedule so we need to seat them all and I, I don't recommend that for one you're flipping rooms like crazy and making it chaos because they're short appointments a lot of turnover a lot of patients coming in I think we should go a little slow on the um, jamming the schedule we need to step up our OSHA we're going to need to communicate let me wash my hands right Mm -hmm. We're going to have to, we're, we might have extra PPE to deal with. We need to actually slow down the schedule. So how are you going to make a profit if you have to slow down the schedule? That means you need to schedule perfectly. There is no room for error. We have to find large appointments and then seat the seats as we go along. Your crown seats or temporaries have been sitting there for months. It doesn't matter. One more day is not going to affect them. One more week is not going to affect them. So you may have a patient that you're putting in a bridge and they owe $3,600. Maybe that's who I want to see right away. Um, but we have to think about these things and, and schedule a nice day. Um, we may need to hire a sterile tech. Um, there's a lot of different ways to go about, but you definitely have to go by who's the most important person um, that we need to schedule and block schedule, learn how to do it. Block has a whole different I mean, you could talk an hour just on block scheduling. Everybody's got their own thoughts on what it is. Um, but ultimately, the doctor has to design their day. If, if they want to do root canals all day, then that's their choice, whatever they want to do. But you can't just cram as many patients in as possible. Patient, you're not giving good customer service. 
and it's not fair to the patients to be rushed through and things like that. So we have to calm down and know that we, we might be booked six or eight weeks. We have to create an ASAP list. And when we create the ASAP list, we need to know exactly when those patients are um, available. I don't want to call 1,500 patients to book my Tuesday at 2. I just want to call the people Tuesday in the afternoon that are free. So it, it takes a lot of organization. Um, you know, yeah, scheduling, uh, what I'm finding is the front desk just don't understand how to schedule and there's no system in the place for them to look and see how to schedule. Because I can tell you the people that rescheduled all the people for out of during COVID, most employees deleted the appointment, which right. means the notes are gone, how much time we needed is gone. They did not break it in the broken cancel list. Even when doctors tell me they, my employees do that, we ran the unscheduled broken list for those dates of COVID shutdown and there'd be like one patient a day in the list. So one employee knew how to do it, the rest did not. Um, and I don't understand why they would right click and delete an appointment. Um, why would you delete something? Why would you not put it in a list? Makes no sense. Sure. And you, you, you know, again, you have the time, you make a really good point. Um, you know, as a, as a business school uh, graduate, um, one of the, one of the great uh, manufacturing studies that I remember doing, this was a few years ago at Indiana, um, and th this might date it, but you know, the question was, how did the Japanese get so far ahead of us in manufacturing in the seventies and the eighties? You know, they were killing us. Uh, you never, you never saw a Nissan or a Honda or a Toyota, and now suddenly they grew bigger than GM and Ford. And so you would do these case studies that would go back to the end of World War II. I don't know if you've ever heard this, but this is how it worked. You know, Ford was making tanks and GM was making airplanes and whatever they were making. And when they got back and suddenly we had money and, you know, GIs came home and they wanted to buy a new house and a new car, they had to shift back to making automobiles. So the, the best ideas they had were really an iteration of last year and the year before and the year before, and they've got this factory in, you know, wherever in Detroit, so they're going to retool that, and, you know, it could be better if it was bigger, but that's too much cost, and they had all these parameters. Yep. Well, the Japanese economy was devastated, you know, everything was flattened, and there was actually an American, Frederick Taylor, who went to Japan, and he was a consultant, and he said, you know, we really have a clean slate. So what is the best way to do it? Not based on how we used to do it. We don't have a factory to retool. We have a factory we're gonna build from scratch. So what should it look like? We have a workflow, we're gonna start from scratch. So what should it look like? And 20 years later, you know, Ford, GM and Chrysler are struggling and Chrysler's in bankruptcy and uh, Toyota, Honda and Nissan are kicking our butt. But it all came from that simple concept um, you know, ironically, an uh, American consultant who said, you have a blank slate here. Start, what's the best way to do it? So I think that's kind of what you're saying, your ideal day. And do docs even have, I know block scheduling, you're right, everybody has a definition, but do they know what an ideal day looks like? Is that something you could say, you know, help them, direct them to figure out their ideal day? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it has to be customized to the practice. Some doctors are like, my eyes are bonkers. I don't want a bunch of anterior fillings that are cosmetic, detailed, intricate work at two o'clock. My eyes are tired. So they have to ultimately design their day that they like to do. There are things that they're doing that they don't like to do. They don't like to work on kids. They don't like root canals, whatever. Um, then don't do it. Like save your heart muscle and do what you like to do. If you're an implant dentist, be one. If you're you know, a cosmetic dentist than be one. Um, but, you know, there, there's just so much to analyze. Um, even if you were to analyze treatment plans, a lot of doctors, when we discuss P&Ls and numbers, a lot of doctors, you know, say they have an 80% treatment plan case acceptance rate. But when we look at it and say, okay, outside of insurance, forget all the thousand dollar ones and under, right? Anybody will do a filling when they owe 30 bucks. If you have a, something over the $1,500 mark, how many are you selling? Most doctors are at five or 10%. Hmm. And so they need communication skills. They need treatment planning skills. They've got to figure out how can we get the patient to inspire the desire to do it, right? Hmm. Uh, without you telling them, we, we can't tell them what to do. That doesn't inspire them to do it. So 
Um, you know, role playing right now is something they can do. They can meet their teams even weekly over Zoom um, and they should connect with them and things like this. But, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, training manuals. You, you, some people don't even want some of their staff to come back and some of the staff has quit or after, after the, um, you know, they're not communicating with the doctors. You can tell who's checked out. Or we've looked at the accounts and realizing, holy cow, they're so screwed up. I don't want this girl back. So that's happening a lot too. Um, but you know, the SOP manuals where, where we're videotaping how to do it or writing out how we expect things done, what numbers, what KPIs or key performance indicators should each employee be doing. We want the front desk to go, how much should be collected over the counter? And did you collect it? I mean, we need to make sure this stuff's happening. Um, so there, there's just a lot they could be working on, but job descriptions and right now, even the websites, if you're not, if, you, if, if your practice is perfect, work on your website because SEO takes one, two, three months before it works. Well, why not start doing a blog where it has some good SEO words in it? Or, uh, you know, why not figure out your niche and how you're different from your competitors? Uh, maybe you want to change your SEO to new patients welcome or dentist in your town or emergency dentist because everybody's going to be an emergency you know there's things there's action we can take and it all depends on your budget right i've seen um some people talk about social media and you know they say don't make it difficult uh take your iphone you know you can be at your practice you're the only one there and spend do a two to three minute explanation of what this is or that is and just put it on your practice's uh, Facebook page. But the doc is, you know, don't make it highly polished. Don't worry about that. Worry about the message. Speak to speak to the phone as if you're speaking to your patients and yeah. say, hey, hey, when we come back, you know, we're going to get rid of this stuff. We realized, you know, you're going to care about uh, dental aerosols. And um, I, I mean, seriously, Heidi, how many... I don't know. I've heard the word dental aerosols more in five minutes in the last month than I have in 15 years of, you know, being in the dental business. Um, patients know this stuff now. It is high on their list. So communicate that or start communicating that. But it has to start with you in the back end saying, all right, got to get rid of that. Got to do this. And you have the time right now to sort of, to you do have sort of a clean slate. Yeah. Um, to do that. And the schedule part of it, I think you're, you're right on. You can, if you don't like kids and you're saying, all right, what's the next three months going to look like, whatever day that starts, you know, I don't want to see kids or I want to see them after four o'clock or I want to, whatever you do, practice owners really have that luxury right now in a sense to create their ideal schedule when, when we come back. Yeah. And there's a lot of dentists laid off as associates. So mm -hmm. we can hire Pedo, we can hire Indo, we can hire whatever we want. That's so. Even catch up. It can be even a temporary fix, right? You could just say, you know, you're helping me catch up. And if we, you want to help market the practice or do some social media or people start requesting you or you can get mm -hmm. new patient referrals, then fill your schedule. You can stay. That is. So, um, Anything else nuts and boltsy? And it, we've sort of done a really good job, I think, of laying the groundwork for when you do come back um, anyway. But um, anything, and the, the um, merging insurance, um, I mean, that's a thing I've never thought of, but I have seen. Um, and I, I guess what, what you're saying is somebody put in, you know, ABC insurance and somebody else put in ABC insurance. So we have them sort of in there twice and we think they don't owe us anything if we're looking at this patient, but over here they owe us $13,000. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of how that works as we, yeah, or the course of the day, put them in? Yeah, you have to call again or go online and get their benefits and update it because it's only updating the patients that are attached to that particular plan. Uh, so you're working twice. It just doesn't make sense. Okay. Yeah. And that's a thing that, again, a doc doesn't know. You know, we do the work. We, we um, you know, we see the patient. Theoretically, money's coming in. Um, well, even statements. Um, you know, what I would tell them to do is find out when the last time statements were sent. Okay. Because what we're finding is it was 2018 or last January. And we need to know why. Why is month end not happening? Right. Why is statements not going out? And guess what? If people aren't paying, maybe you need to attach interest to your accounts. Because when they pile up their bills, they're paying whoever's charging them interest. But dentists don't charge interest. I don't know why. Most of them, you know, some do. But most of them do it after they talk to me. 
Um, but they should be charging interest. We are a professional business. If it's over 60 days old, you're, it's, it's your responsibility to pay. So if they um, want patients to pay attention to their bills, they need to put interest on it and get them calling you. You can always reverse an interest if you have a special arrangement, but we want them to let, we want to let them know it's a special circumstance. I'm gonna go ahead and adjust that, you know, as long as I have your post-dated check for two weeks or whatever. Um, another thing they could do is program their computer on the statements to say certain things. For example, um, zero to 30, if they have insurance, the computer, you can tell it what to say. If they have insurance and it's under 30 days old, just say, um, you know, your insurance has been billed. Um, so they know, they're not like, what, I owe this, like your insurance has been billed, they just haven't paid yet or whatever. And then 30 to 60 days, hey, please follow up with your insurance, right? Mm -hmm. So you can have different notes on your thing when it's over 90 days old, you know, to avoid collections, please remit the balance within 10 days or whatever you wanna say. But program it to a non-insurance and an insurance account so the statements do the work for you. It explains what's going on. And then as you notice you've posted everything, then you can customize a note. So when the statement goes out, whether you send it right then and there, or whether the, the automatic every 30 day thing goes out, it's already customized to that patient. Your insurance has responded to all claims. This is your remaining balance due. Now they don't have to call your office and say, do I owe or not? It says it right there. So as we're posting payments, we should customize their statement so they know what's going on. That will prevent less calls. That will prevent calls, right? Of, you know, right. Inquiring about their account, and then they'll just pay. There, are, it seems like a lot of that are things that happened when you set your software up, yep. whatever that was. You know, 2007, we set it up, and it's awesome. It's been working great, except you don't realize that you know all the things you don't you don't know what you don't know. So there are all these things you've never really set up set up that you can tweak now while you have the time to step back, look at the whole thing and say, what are some things? If we were starting today, what will we do? And then we'd say, oh my gosh, we would put us, put, yeah, put a message on the statements that do this. Or you have an employee who programmed it and it says, um, you are no longer allowed to have an appointment here if you don't pay your bill. Right. So you better know what's going on in your statements. Right. Yeah, and I think that is, that's, that's, that is a, that's a good point, Heidi. I've heard that more probably in the last two weeks as people would have an office manager who's calling. In fact, I, I called a friend um, who um, somebody called me and said, hey, I just got this call where they said, you know, you were scheduled for hygiene a couple of weeks from now. We're just canceling all those and we'll pick you up in October. Um, and, you know, I called and I said, so what's your thought behind that? And you know, his answer was, I have no idea. Why would we do that? And I've said, well, I don't know, but this is who's calling. So what was happening is the office manager, she was just treating it like any other day, like a minor inconvenience. Like, you know, we had a storm and the power's out for a couple of days. So we're just gonna, we won't bother with that person. Again, this is a very large chunk of your revenue that's not gonna happen. So, you know, I've had people say, when, as we come back, you know, we've usually been off Fridays. We work four days a week. So the plan is we're working five days or we're working uh, from, you know, eight to seven one day a week in five days. But, but we got to get these patients we missed in this hole back into the schedule somehow. And yes, we're not, you know, we're, we're sort of prioritizing by, you know, Crown and Bridge and, you know, create a schedule where it's a revenue producing schedule. And, you know, that might become a habit. It might be better for you with a few of that. And suddenly you say, you know, we can do this if we're smarter about it. Um, but yeah, I, I had that, literally had that conversation uh, last week and the doc said, why would we do that? And yeah. he was just handling it like she sort of thought she should. So maybe that's a good, have you, you seen that kind of thing? Like that communication gap and standard, like the way we've always done it versus this is never like we've been anything we've ever done. Yep. Yeah, they don't understand that people want to be taken care of. So the ball's in your court. You run your business the way you want to run it. Another thing they should do that I should have brought up is get all the insurance companies EFT, where they're electronically funds in the bank immediately. And that's more of a, that's like a form type thing. You've yes. got to apply for it, fill out a form, 
you know, your account, your routing and account number and all that, that again, you just, you haven't been able to get to for the last year and a half. And you don't really want other people knowing all your routing slips. So it's something right. you have to have routing numbers. Uh, so yeah, you have to do it yourself. So that, you know, two things pop in my mind from that in this situation that we're in. Number one is, again, paper. Uh, so people are going to be very conscious. Not only, first of all, we're not, you know, wasting as many, cutting down as many trees. But number two, you know, we're not transferring things by paper anymore if there is none. And number two, you know, if you, um, the, uh, what is it, the stimulus checks. Um, I'm in a, several groups and, you know, own some businesses where I've started seeing these text groups uh, this week. Hey, got my stimulus check today. Showed up in the bank. Um, you know, that's about a two week process. But if you're waiting on a paper check, it could be, they say like July or August, um, which is exactly the same as the insurance company. When, you know, they, when a computer runs all those things and spits out all those transactions, it shows up in your bank account. Yep. When you have to wait for them to print, I don't know, 27,000 checks every Friday, you know, it, you could add, I mean, you could add a week or more. Could it be yeah. more than that? I, I mean, you do it every day. I don't know, but it, it, it adds. Yeah, and and time is money, um, so that's awesome. That's a great idea. And they have to reconcile it. In other words, I run a report which you have to set up as insurance payment. You you don't you always want like visas, one payment, cash, care credit, mm -hmm. whatever. You have the different categories and payments. You'll have to set up an EFT one. So it's, you know, Delta EFT, MetLife EFT or whatever. Um, that way you can match it to the bank account because it, we're getting it in the bank, but then the patients aren't getting the money posted to their account. So you actually have to verify it against your computer system. Okay. Okay. And those so are all things that... Being in a separate account. These are all things somebody could, uh, if they wanted to reach out to you and say, Heidi, that sounds awesome, but I'm overwhelmed. Can you know? Can you just help me? Uh, yeah, we actually prioritize. That's a lot. I, I feel confident you'll do that, right? <laughs> yeah. So, how could somebody? Uh, and I wonder. I had a note here. You have a, a book that covers a lot of this, right? Um, um, well, I have a. Well, I have a lot of resources, but mm -hmm. they can grab a printable. It looks like ten oh. secrets to increasing what does it say 10 secrets to increasing tomorrow's revenue so they can grab that by going to coachingdentist.com and they can just snatch that and print it out they can opt out they can do whatever they want but grab your printable and that's a free download right they can just free get download. that free yeah i give a lot of video tips um as you come along in my emails and things like that okay um, on how to make money and things and i have a private facebook group that people can find me in called coaching with heidi mount if okay. they like my style, I, I'm kind of picky about who I let in, but <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. hopefully coaching there that I teach quite a bit in. So they're welcome. And then they can email me if they want. Um, H-E-I-D-I -I is Heidi at coachingdentist.com is my email. I'm more than happy to not get spam, but <laughs> right. people out. And I'll put the link. It's coaching dentist with uh, not plural singular yeah, singular.com right my my full website is hi, um coach heidi mount okay so. we'll put i'll put those links i'll make sure they're in here you know that people can get a hold of you and reach out and you said you do a like a newsletter a daily or um how often two a month is what i send okay. out okay so enough that you know if you're a practice owner you could digest that on your friday mornings when you get back to normal and and not uh, not overdone. Okay, awesome. Heidi, any parting thoughts before you head out to, uh, can you even go outside in Hawaii? I'm swimming in the ocean. So oh my gosh, see? Yeah, <laughs> well, good for you. I'm glad somebody is. Um, any parting thoughts for practice owners who say, wow, this, uh, you know, they kind of now have a laundry list and like me, they got a page of notes on uh, what to do next. Any parting thoughts for somebody who's kind of struggling with it all out there right now? Yeah, just try not to stress. Some people think, oh my gosh, I don't even know where to begin. I'm so overwhelmed. Now I have anxiety, you know, that type of thing I hear a lot. Um, there's no need to stress. You work on one thing at a time. Anybody can save their business. Lots of people call me when they're ready to claim bankruptcy. They're all savable. I've never had one where I'm like, give it up. You know what I mean? Right. Unless they have a gambling problem or something, I, you know, mm -hmm. it's 
always savable. They just have to know how to focus and where to put their effort. Um, but stay strong and, you know, know that we're all going to, you know, bounce back from this. And it's a, it's a good learning lesson of, uh, yeah. you know, what we went without. <laughs> yep. Yep. It's um, good. Um, good opportunity. You're still, you know, as uh, my friend uh, Craig Spodak says, you know, he built a gigantic, like, I don't know, quadrillion dollar office. And, and he said, you know, I was all worried about, can I pay for it? And he said, then one day I just realized, uh, I'm still a dentist. So if it all blows apart, I don't get practice in Miami, you know, maybe I like Denver better. So I'll just move to Denver and, Denver and I'm still a dentist. So you're still a dentist. This is a business structure. You'd hate to lose it. And, uh, but I think you're right on that is a great message. You can, you know, they all are savable in some form or fashion. So, but you do have to reach out. You do have to ask. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, Heidi, I appreciate it. Thanks for, you know, thanks for taking a break in your um, swimming and um, uh, swimming in the ocean. And um, with that, we're going to wrap this one up and call it, um, call it done. Um, stay tuned for uh, the next episodes of Coming Back Stronger. If you have practice owners, if you have any suggestions, anything you really want to hear, uh, I reached out to Heidi because of uh, an email that I got that somebody says, you know, what can I be doing or my, uh, how do I work on my systems while I'm shut down? Um, keep those emails coming. I get a lot of them. Um, and again, if you are feeling a tremendous amount of anxiety, there is help. There's always somebody who will help. And, you know, somebody like Heidi, who does a really good job of, I think, just helping you. If somebody sent you an email and said, I'm struggling. They get a reply, I'm guessing. Absolutely. Awesome. So with that, we'll wrap this one up. And practice owners, hang in there. And until next time, um, looking forward to you coming back stronger.